Welcome to episode 32 of Divine Superconductor Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm speaking with Dr. John Jaquish. He's an inventor. He's created a lot of really cool things, something called OsteoStrong, which we go into a little bit in the interview. And his latest invention is called the X3 Bar. And this is a revolutionary new way of building strength. I used to go to Gold's Gym with my friend and work out and drink the whey protein shakes. And I didn't see results even going consistently for quite a long time. And when I started to focus more on high quality protein sources and I was deadlifting, I was gaining strength, but at the expense of stressing my body and I had a lot of back pain. And what's cool about X3 is it's very safe. You're actually working out with resistance bands, but instead of just using the resistance bands by themselves, he sells a kit where there's actually a bar and then a plate. And so he goes into that a little bit in the interview but it basically is a system that you can travel with. You only need to use it for 10 minutes a day. Sometimes my workouts are even less than that, sometimes seven minutes around there. And it's very safe for the joints. I'm focused on longevity. You know, if I have a choice between being an athlete and living longer, I'm going to personally choose living longer because I value my time with my family and friends. And this is a very safe way to gain muscle, which is not just for vanity, Although that's a side benefit, it's also for blood sugar regulation. You know, glycogen is not only stored in the liver, it's also stored in the muscles. So it basically gives you a bigger battery pack. And you'll notice, obviously, we have some dietary differences. He's not a fan of carbohydrates. I am a form of carbohydrates. But what I think it's important to emphasize is that everybody needs animal products. Even if it's a vegan, you know, be vegan, have some bee products because animal products and the amino acids and the structure of those aminos and the ratios and the strength is so specific to animal foods. You can't find the same level of nutrition in plant foods. So I think that's a place where we can all agree. And when you combine high quality protein with variable resistance, which is what he'll go into in this interview, you get massive gains very quickly. So enjoy. All right, I'm here with John Jakish. Welcome to the show. Jake Wish. Jake Wish, shoot. <laughs> I should have asked you before we started. <laughs> well, you see it written all the time. You probably just don't <laughs> think about how it's pronounced. Yeah, for sure. Is that French or? Uh, yeah, the background is it used to be de Jacques, D E J A Q U E S. But uh, when my family immigrated to the United States, it was uh, before the country was a country. And uh, they changed it to make it sound more American. They did not do a very good job of that. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I have a pretty English name, Blackburn. So, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, cool. So, yeah, we're just going to chat about uh, the X3 and the things that you've invented. I was checking out your website, and uh, you have a couple cool other things, like the Fracture Proof. Is that a little app that you designed? And you have yep. the Osteo Strong. And that's right. Super cool. I think I found out about your work at the Bulletproof Conference like many years ago, and I used that OsteoStrong thing, and I was like, dang, I'm, okay. this is a weird feeling of like where, where do you use OsteoStrong? Which location? I actually haven't been to a facility yet. I'm planning to. Oh, okay, okay. I've only used it at like health conferences, but yeah. um, you designed that for uh, in, improving bone density, right? Kind of inspired by your mother? Yeah, my mother had low bone density, and I wanted to figure out how to fix that problem, and she read the data for the pharmaceuticals and didn't want to take those. And uh, so I, I said, uh, maybe I can find another way. And that's, that's how I got started. That's super cool. And it, it's my understanding it's creating like micro fractures deep in the bone. And so no, that stimulates. Not at all. No. No, oh, no. Wow. How does it work? No, I, a lot of people think that though. Uh, so it's, it's deformation of bone. So like everything your central nervous system decides to change, whether it be a muscle, tendon, ligament, bone, has to do with something that becomes irritated. So like you can see it on your hands when you build a callus, 
right? Like your hand becomes slightly irritated in a specific way through pressure, and then you develop thicker skin in that, in that area. What happens to the bone? Uh, there's no, no fractures going on, but the bone, especially the, the, inner, the inner matrix, the trabecular bone, the middle, becomes deformed. And in that deformation, that's actually, it's called spongy bone uh, because it doesn't actually fracture at all, it bends. And that bending, the central nervous system says, okay, we don't like that. We don't want that bending to happen. So to keep from bending, minerals get absorbed into the bone mass and the bone matrix becomes more powerful. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. And there's different exercises you do at the facility, right? Because I think I just did the bench style one, but there's all different Yeah, ones. there's four movements that all emulate high impact forces. And so like when I first treated my mother, uh, I was just, you know, in the lab. Uh, and she was, it was me, her, and my father were the only ones that were using it. But I reversed her osteoporosis in 18 months. And she had the bones of a 30-year-old after 18 months. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And she was compromised. Like she was, she had osteoporosis. Uh, so that wow. now, now she has, you know, bones of a much younger person than she is. She's in her eighties. That's incredible. Yeah. I think I'm a fan of your, uh, your Facebook group's great. And if I'm correct, you're a fan of the carnivore diet. And I think nutrition plays a big role. I was vegetarian vegan for many years, unfortunately, like over a decade and mm. now eating a ton of red meat and a ton of animal products, raw milk. It's just all of those uh, good minerals and protein. Yeah. That's like a huge piece. Yeah. <laughs> once, once I learned about, so when I developed X3, uh, so in the bone density came first, but then those observations I made through the research with uh, bone density medical device, uh, it became very apparent to me that when we lift weights, it, lifting weights doesn't really make sense because we're overloading joints and underloading muscle. So the limiting, like you, you stop when you lift because of joint pain. Like I don't care how tough somebody thinks they are, how, you know, how many sideways hats they have. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. It just like you stop because your joints are feeling the fatigue. Muscle could go a lot further. And so uh, that ends up what, you know, what, what's, hap what's happening. And, and then ultimately people over time, they get a lot of cumulative joint damage that becomes permanent. And uh, then they quit lifting after a certain amount of years. So these guys lifting heavy year after year, and then eventually they just, it hurts to get out of a chair. So they just quit. Uh, and so once realizing that humans are seven times more capable in the impact ready range of motion, which is what I really studied and what the basis of the medical device was. Once realizing that, I thought, okay, like we could do way better than weightlifting. We just need to change the weight. Now, the good news is I found a bunch of research on variable resistance. So, and this is one of these conversations that's just very circular and happens all the time on the users group as, as uh, you've seen where the, there, I, there's seven studies that have been done on variable resistance, and all seven of them showed that you can grow muscle faster, gain strength faster with variable resistance over regular weight training. So when I ask a person, okay, we have two groups of people. One group of people is lifting weights. The other group of people has weights and they have variants. And that second group grew three times the amount of muscle or strength. So one is weights, the other one is weights and variants. So what's the important factor there? Variants. Variants, <laughs> right. Right. Though, it's wild. Right. Though people, like when I ask that question, they'll be like, well, it's obviously weights. Like, you know, like <laughs> wow, like who ties your shoes for you in the morning? Uh, so it's, it's been, uh, I, I thought launching a medical device and having to convince medical doctors of the efficacy of the device was going to be the hard thing. And then doing something in fitness is like, oh, you know, okay. Like clinical trials aren't like a thing in fitness and the level of scrutiny 
would be less so. But what I didn't understand was that the fitness industry, and I, I shouldn't say as an industry, but the, the fans of fitness aren't necessarily connoisseurs of research. And sometimes you can show them a study and it's like, well, what about, why, why isn't Mr. Olympia doing this? Like, okay, he, he's a genetic outlier who admits to taking performance enhancing drugs. So who cares? Like, does that apply to you? Yeah. You probably heard of the documentary, the vegan propaganda game changers. And oh yeah. All oh, those guys are on yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they can like Dr. Baker has been poking holes in that thing and he's just poking holes in that thing just from like the trailer. <laughs> like just like we don't even know what the, what's in the film yet but uh, yeah just from some of the some of the people you know like like they they omit there there was a, a guy who played for the Tennessee Titans who went vegan and bragged about it and he got sponsored by I mean I don't know maybe Nabisco you know <laughs> somebody somebody who's uh grinding up wheat grain and telling you that you know it's healthy for you to eat uh, and then, and then, of course, what the film doesn't say is the guy's career was ruined, wow. and he he retired from football. Like his performance just took a nosedive, and he got all kinds of injuries and joint inflammation. And he quit. So Jeez. yeah, they didn't cover that part. <laughs> all the inflammatory pea protein and grains and soy and <laughs> right, right, yeah, oxalates, all kind. Yeah. And how about how about the fact that the the protein from vegetable sources is not very bioavailable. We're talking like 16% bioavailability. Yeah. I had Dr. Cass Ingram on my podcast. He's like the osteopath oregano guy. At oh, yeah, okay. and, and he was saying like eggs and milk are like the most absorbable foods. And the vegans like say, oh, those are the worst mucus and acid forming, but they're like 50% bioavailable milk and eggs. It's like <laughs> right. Well, human breast milk is 50%. Or or goat's milk, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that I haven't looked at, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 50% bioavailability is like a big deal. And you know, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just kind of jumping back here. I used to go to gold's gym with my friend and, you know, we go there five days a week and I think I was slamming whey protein shakes and I'm a hard gainer and I was probably you know, undernourished. Well, I definitely was, uh, yeah. wasn't getting enough calories, wasn't getting enough protein. And, I saw zero results in about a year. And then now that I've been on X3 for, I think a few months now, I'm getting messages from my friends, Matt, you look bigger. Like, yeah, right. it works quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, it, it, it's totally gonna change the world of, um, I, I don't wanna just say muscular performance, but, uh, the the how lean we can get how muscular we can become because it takes the joint inefficiencies out of it like that's not part of the equation anymore you truly are fatiguing the muscle you're fatiguing the joint too because you do go to fatigue in a weaker range of motion but you do so in a diminishing range and that's part of the protocol and so you're fatiguing every, every part of the range of motion it just doing it with a relevant weight based on the capacity of that. And I, I just, oh, what I, you know, what I was saying was once I came to this realization, I, I found seven studies that all said variable resistance is more powerful. And so I thought, well, why hasn't the world jumped on this? Well, there's two reasons. One is no one could quantify how much variance. And two if you grab a band, like a heavy one, and try and do like a, you know, throw it around your back and try and do a push-up, you start twisting your wrists outwardly, and you could injure your wrist or even break it. So you can't get any heavy loading by just grabbing a band. You need something to, like, our bodies do not interface well with round surfaces. We do great with flat ones, like the ground, for example. So if you can figure out a way to attach the bands to the ground, which is what I did with X3, there's a second ground. You stand on a plate and the bands flex and move under the plate. And then you have an Olympic bar. We interface with bars very well. We can grab, our hands are designed to grab all of those. That's a perfect handle. 
And on the other thing is like um, a lot of people didn't really understand this at first, but uh, like barbell movements, like the strongest people in the world, do they use barbells or dumbbells? Barbells, right? Right. Yeah. They don't hardly do anything with dumbbells because your central nervous system knows it doesn't matter how heavy you're, you're moving. You probably got to move one leg at a time because we're not kangaroos, right? But if you're going to grab something heavy, would you do it with one hand? Both. No. Would you grab two heavy things at once? Why would you do that? If you needed to move two heavy things. So, like, I mean, dumbbells are like trying to get a tan with candles. <laughs> now, of course, we're conflating this with the whole problem with static resistance versus variable resistance. And, you know, we're talking about two different variables at once. But, yeah, that's why all you really need is the bar, the single bar. Because if you're going to move something heavy, you're going to use both arms. Right. That's it. Have you ever Doesn't used that? Doesn't need more complicated. That's, that's a great explanation. Um... Have you ever used the hex bar? Because that's what I was using like last year before I got into X3. And I was just, there were some days where I was like, my back was sore, you know, and I know deadlifts can just wreck your back. I, I don't love X3s. the hex bar uh, because the width of the body, like you wouldn't choose to grab that width. You grab the width of the bar. Whereas a straight bar, you grab at your shoulder width at exactly your shoulder width. Like you never see somebody deadlifting with their arms spread out, right? I mean, it would just give you shoulder damage where you get off the ground. Uh, so you just, you know, it's, it's lined up exactly where you need to be. Plus we live in a sagittal world. We bend forward to do most things we do. We don't bend backwards. So grabbing a hold of something in front of you is very natural. Now, some people get better loading with a hex bar, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily the right thing to do. You know, like, it, I, I call these things like, um, just kind of like bad paths to go down. Like, uh, I forgot who the bodybuilder was in, in some, there was some documentary I saw where the guy was like all about EMG. If he thought if he can get more electrical activity in the muscle, he was like training, you know, the best and he was going to win. Now, of course, bodybuilding is a beauty contest. So, like, I don't know why that would matter. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's just you're judged based on how you look. So it's like making a muscle grow. Is that really the contest? I don't know. It doesn't seem to be. But I'm not an expert on the subject. I also don't care. Uh, but what was interesting was I, I'm, I'm watching this thing and I'm thinking, EMG. Like, that doesn't even have anything to do with growth. Like, if you look at the EMG activity in your quadriceps during a squat versus during a quad extension, well, the quad extension is through the roof, right? I mean, you, when you do a quad extension, you can see the activation in your legs way bigger than a squat. And what does EMG stand for again? Uh, um, electron uh, my, my, uh, myography. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, electron myography. So it's the so electrical, just electrical activity. activity in the muscle. It's like, it. You see when somebody attaches leads to a muscle and then looks at like a meter to yeah. see how much electro, electrical activity. So activity and triggering growth are not necessarily the same thing is my point. So you get more activity with a quad extension, but you'll never catch a guy in the NFL doing a quad extension ever. I mean, not in the last like 30 years. Because that's not really, that's trying to get a tan with candles also. Just, it's not the way it works. You got to use the muscle in the format that it's designed to fire in normal movement. You know, like exploding off the ground or running or sprinting. Uh, not just isolating the quadricep and extending it and putting incredible amounts of pressure through the patellar tendon, which is... You know, if you go heavy enough, is almost assured you'll cause damage. And we're not just talking about, a, like, growth hormone's not the only thing, right, that we're stimulating. There's multiple other things. Yeah, we're, uh, well, so mostly what drives testosterone upregulation, now, that's both upregulation of testosterone and the receptors of testosterone, which is actually more important. 
Both of those things have to do with how heavy you go. This is why I like the people who train light or train with like bands only. Like they can't go heavy enough. So like I see people with just, oh, I work out with just bands alone, you know, without the X3. And I'm like, hey, I invented that thing for a reason. Like you can't go heavy enough. So they're doing 90 minute workouts where they're jumping up and down with the bands and they're doing crossovers for 10 sets or whatever. The load's not high enough. I mean, sure, it's exercise, but if you're going to do that, just do some push-ups, do air squats. Like, just you got a, you got body weight, you just you do that. Like, but you're not going to build any mass doing that. It's, it all has it has to do with how heavy you go. And so, the the one of the driving things behind what I wanted to accomplish with X3 is I wanted to be able to do a chest press. Where now I I always call it the 500 pound band, but I'm a six foot tall person, so. Uh, if you have you use the X3 app, the do you use the app? I haven't checked it out. No. Okay, yeah, it's great. It'll tell you like you enter your height, and it'll tell you what is the peak force in each movement. So for me, that that's uh, five hundred. I think it's five hundred forty pounds uh, at the top of a chest press. So I can get the benefit of that five hundred forty pounds at the top, but it's only three hundred something in the middle and a hundred pounds at the bottom. So I first fatigue, and you do it too, first fatigue in the stronger range, and then in the mid-range, and then in the weak range. And then when you're done with that set, you can't do another set. You're wiped out. You, and you've stimulated more growth than you ever could with a regular weight because you can't fatigue the impact-ready range of motion with a weight. You can't. Yeah. You and cannot I fatigue the mid-range either because to get it there, you've got to go through the weaker range. And so once you cram all of this into one set, and especially when you uh, do it exactly how I describe, you have a hypoxic effect within the muscle. You're not letting any blood in or out. So that's why I tell people to keep constant tension. Did you read any of the stuff I wrote about hypoxia? I haven't yet. I just remember in uh, your 12-week program, it's like, Every video, you're like constant, constant tension. tension. You like yeah. really Don't hammer that Don't walk out at the top and do not rest at the bottom. Uh, it's great because I think a lot of people do watch those videos. And I'd say about 80% of people are getting it perfect. Another 10% are so-so and then 10% are screwing it up completely. But, you know, it's okay. Uh, they'll, they'll figure it out at some point. Somebody will tell them, no, 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 no. Don't, don't rest at the bottom. Uh, so... So ultimately, when you keep constant tension, you're not letting any blood in or out. So you're truly exhausting the ATP, glycogen, and creatine phosphate, the fuels within the muscle. So your your primary, like the first driver of growth is the myofibril fatigue. By the way, I did not ask how much your audience likes science, so I don't know. If I'm going <laughs> they way love too it. Deep or... They love it. No. Okay. Keep going. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I could just be like going way to you and you're like sitting there going, wow, like no one's going to like this at all. I'm um, loving it. It's great. <laughs> so first you fatigue from the muscular structure standpoint. That's myofibril fatigue. This is like the kind of thing that happens to gymnasts when they slam into the ground and they get 10 times their body weight through their lower extremities. So that is a major driver of power to weight ratio. So that is strength more so than mass, but also mass. Uh, and then as you, as you fatigue with diminishing range, then you're really burning into the fuel stores of the muscle. And the quicker you can uh, uh, exhaust those, that's a signal for the central nervous system to say, okay, we got to store more ATP, glycogen, and creatine phosphate within the cells so that's, and that's the primary driver for size. Awesome. I love right. it. And so you're getting the, the most powerful, you know, st stimulus for power and the stimulus for size, as well as uh, long-term potentiation. So that's a central nervous system change. That's training the body to fire more tissue altogether. And by loading the impact ready range of motion, that's the number one driver of that. So it's recruitment. It's the sort of power density of muscle stimulus and then the size all, all at, at the same time. Awesome. And I yeah. think you said in one video, it's a myth that you have to eat right, like right after the gym. I'm like, oh, I have to go get a burrito back in the yes. day. Yes. 
It's like yeah, a bodybuilding. There is no thing. such thing as the anabolic window. Like somebody does a workout and they're like, oh, quick, I need to have my protein shake. Like, no, you don't. If you have it, most of the muscle protein synthesis that happens to you happens while you sleep. Uh, so you could, you could have your nutrition anytime in a 24 hour period and, and you're going to have, you know, the same result. No, no, no difference th- at all. Okay. And that's the same thing at growth hormone, right? We get that, like, I think it's after two hours of sleep, we get a burst of human yeah. growth hormone. That's right. Yeah. And, and it, in every two hours you get another burst. Yeah. Yeah. Growth hormone pulses. It doesn't have a like it has like a, it almost looks like a heartbeat. Like it jumps way up and then kind of drops off and then jumps way up again. Yeah. Awesome. And jumping back, you mentioned uh, we move in the sagittal way and I'm sure you're familiar with the biomechanics crowd and, you know, the down talk yoga and I have friends that are into sure. like functional movements, biomechanics, that whole thing. And uh, a lot of people say strength training is like not functional because like gaining muscle just makes us tense and not flexible and, what are your yeah, thoughts? Because I, I look at it from a longevity perspective. Like it helps with sure. our blood sugar regulation and so much, right? To have muscle. Well, flexibility is flexibility. Like I don't care how big, you know, and muscular you are. Like I, I know guys who are 240 pound muscular guys who can do the splits and, you know, whatever. Uh, not that the splits are a standard of, you know, what people should be doing, but it's just, you know, that, the flexibility argument is just, it's kind of a separate thing. Uh, weightlifting doesn't make you tight. That, that's not been seen in any academic literature. Uh, you know, I see some yoga movements as very functional. Also, the word functional is so abused. I mean, ultimately, the function of a muscle is to shorten. So anything where you move is functional. So like, I mean, I could shut somebody down right there. Like just, no, stop talking. Like now, (laughs) like I said, the central nervous system is going to be more helpful in building musculature if you move in a pattern that is more associated with what you might actually do. So like, that's why multi-joint movements are always better than single joint movements. Doesn't mean you don't want to do single joint movements, but they're better. Like like uh, biceps, bicep growth happens more. You get more of a bicep stimulus for growth with the bent row than you do with the bicep curl. Even though you're isolating the bicep in the bicep curl. It's because when you're moving two joints, you know, when you're moving your elbow and your shoulder joint, pulling in towards your body, that is something the central nervous system sees as, oh, yeah, we do this. Okay, we understand. This is exhausting. So we're going to change, you know, how we, uh, how we attenuate that. Yeah, I was laughing in one of your exercises in the video. You were saying, you know, supinated versus, I forget the other way. And you're like, most people just want big biceps. So you can do it this way with a bent over row. Or if you want to work more the back shoulder, you can do it this way. Uh, so I like how variable X3 is because you can just switch your hands on certain exercises. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's a preferred way to do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I always do supinated. Is that, that way I get the full bicep involved. Uh, also, I think when you, when in a rowing type movement, I think a lot of people like the tendon, the, some of the tendons don't really like that. But I think it's, being supinated is, is, is much better, but yeah. And also, I don't want people to think that like the way I'm using X3 is, and the way I instruct people to do it is the only way. But one of the, this was one of the things I didn't really expect. I didn't realize the ways people were going to invent to use it and how poorly thought out those ways would be. So... In the beginning, I was like, oh, that's a tool. You go ahead and, uh, and apply it. But I just didn't see it coming. Like, wow. Like, the things that people would do that just, you know, where they think, I'm going to get extra growth if I do it this way or if I add in this other movement. And I'm like, oh, no, that's an injury. That's what that is. That's not extra growth. 
So yeah, I have a lot of friends like that. They're always in the improvement mindset, which I think is good sometimes, but sometimes you just have to, you know, follow the program and then see yeah. how you do. And then so many people that are like, Oh, I can make it better. It's like, how about we just start with how it is to start? <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's, there's something about exercise where people, uh, nutrition too. Like I, I gave an example, in one of my nutrition videos where somebody will say, well, like I'm going to be ketogenic, except I also read, uh, the Mediterranean diet where they advocate a lot of uh, bread so since I, I got to eat a lot of fat for ketogenic, I'm going to do both. So I'm just going to eat cheese pizza and I'm going to be in the best shape because I'm doing both of these great diets. Like, no, you just canceled the benefit of both out and you're going to become obese. That's what's gonna happen. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, funny. yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a shame because I say that and people immediately know what I'm talking about yeah. and they laugh. Yet I see that parallel. I, I mean, I, and, and like I try to be as nice as I can as some of these people who, as they're coming to like the, the X3 bar users group for advice, but then some of them give each other advice. And I think, like, should I, should I ruin this guy's day? I really don't <laughs> want to tell him, like, his, his you know, the advice he's giving is just awful. But, I, tr I try know, to merge, like, I just think everyone should come together like to get some type of animal food in the diet because I have a ton of vegan followers, a ton of vegetarian followers, and it's an ethical thing. You know, it's like for the animals. And I think we could all agree that, you know, just getting in animal products in the diet, like that's needed for human health. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it is unfortunate. Like I don't want to hurt anything. Yeah. But I know my biochemistry, we eat animals. Yeah, you know, I'm I mean, type O blood type. Yeah, animals <laughs> eat each other too. We're not going to stop that, right? Uh, yeah. Well, and also, I mean, do, do your vegan and vegetarian friends know that seven billion animals are destroyed every year in the United States for the sake of vegetable farming? We, ultimately, here here's how I want everybody to see that. By the way, I love how we're jumping all over the place. This is fun. It's great. <laughs> um, the, I want people to realize that any expanding species is going to take away resources from another species. So I don't care what we do. If we're farming vegetables, we're ruining the habitat of what used to be there. And anything that comes into that area, farmers are going to poison it, shoot it, get it caught in a trap, grind it up in a, in a you know, uh, one of these combines. I mean, just like if you, if, if you look at like prairie dogs, that just get thrown into a grinder. Like we're talking millions just just chopped up you can see the blood behind some of these some of these combines like okay like ultimately we're an expanding species we're taking away resources from something else there's no way we're going to stop that as long as we're here like our existence is going to negatively impact the you know whatever something else so you know like some some years there's a lot of rainfall uh, in Northern California, and there's a population explosion of mice because there's a lot of seeds for them to eat. And then what do we get a population explosion of next year? Rattlesnakes. All types of snakes, but particularly rattlesnakes. So my, my parents had uh, 40 acres in Napa Valley, and it amazed me. Like, if we saw mice one year, it was like, all right, here come the snakes, because all of a sudden they got so much to eat, so... Now there's snakes everywhere, and they're all. Then there's an ebb and flow of that whole, that whole thing. So like, when when we build a when we build a vegetable farm, it's no different. We're just destroying habitats and killing any animal that comes onto that habitat because the farmers have to. They can't allow millions of birds to land in the uh, you know the fields that grow uh, whatever the the berries for everybody's smoothies. So what do they do? They poison a few million birds. That's it. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah what, that, you, that's, that's life. Like we need those resources. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you looked into like cashews when I was like raw vegan, I was doing like cashew 
salad dressings and that's like usually slave labor you know same as like the chocolate industry <laughs> it's like yeah. quinoa that's the whole thing but yeah I'm a, I'm a big fan of homesteading i have chickens here i have bees and yeah. i just installed a couple bat houses to take care of the mosquitoes and uh i've been thinking about here. buying a steer that's awesome <laughs> right right you know i'm not that's happy great. that the steer had to you know die from my food but that's like you know that'll last a, good me life. Like a year yeah yeah give it a good life before and you know, right. I'm, I'm looking into like carbon dioxide euthanasia, you know, kind of, I'm a fan of like, uh, Joel Salatin and, uh, just kind of advancing agriculture. I think yeah. there's better ways to do it. CO2 just puts the animal to sleep. There's actually stories of people working in tomato fields, the carbon dioxide concentration is so high, they would just yeah. fall asleep and die like farmers. Back then. Yep. It's interesting. Greenhouses. So, it's in greenhouses where that happens. That's, that's it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, but so. wait, I thought that was causing global warming. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, there's so much to unravel. I just, you know, my, my big thing is experience. You know, I tried all the diets, all the lifestyles. I did the fruitarian thing for a few years. And I just tell people, try it. Include some grass-fed red meat, you know, elk, bison, deer, right. beef, and you feel better. And then get some strength training, and you're like, holy crap, I'm actually stronger. You know? Right, right. <laughs> well, and and I I like people to focus on, um, you know, there's the narcissistic side of body composition. We like most people when they start to work out, they don't start to work out for their health. It's because they want to feel like they're better than everybody, right? <laughs> so that's the narcissism. But if that delivers health, that's great. Uh. Now, when you sort of like look at the bigger picture of health, like every organ functions to supply musculature with what it needs. And also musculature is really the thing we can affect. We can, we can get a greater cardiovascular output, but the degree to which you can affect your musculature, you can affect it a lot more than your cardiovascular performance. I mean, just we're talking standard deviations. So that seems to me to be the number one thing we ought to focus on. And ultimately, the two biggest drivers of long life found in hundreds or maybe thousands of different papers are being lean and being strong. Two things that have just never been contested as the drivers of, of long life. So if you're positively impacting musculature, if you're building size, you're building muscle, you're, you're leaner because more of your body weight is made of muscle. Uh, and you're also getting stronger because nobody puts on muscle without getting stronger. So that's the biggest driver of life. So, and, and we also know we need protein for that. Yeah, it's also, it's so funny when I was back, you know, very programmed vegan. I was like so scrawny, <laughs> just like yeah. very deflated, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna calorie restrict, like just all these ideas of like how to extend my life, but I was not yeah. really living. You know, <laughs> it was interesting. How was the conversion back to eating meat? Like it was, it was vegan? amazing. Yeah, I broke it with like a bison burger and my brain switched on and I went back and forth like five times because of ethics. But now that I see, I don't know if you know Tristan Haggard, my, I'm going to interview him, see the whole <laughs> vegan agenda and the Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger and the 3D printing. You know, there's, I think there's an agenda that like demasculinate the male and you know, <laughs> it's like kind of feminization thing. And I look into all that and, uh, you know, there's people don't, it's, it's profit driven. You know, when you yeah. see like a, a soy, you yeah. know, soy I mean, isolate. ultimately weaker people are easier to control. Right. I mean, I'm not much of a conspiracy <laughs> theorist, but I mean, look, if I were going to control a population, I'd want them weaker. Right. If I, if I were going to be an oppressor, but ultimately like, Boy, we're going deep. Uh, yeah, if you if you think of the 1984 nature of a lot of things, um, you can making carbohydrate products. Your source materials are very cheap, and 
I mean, as cheap as dirt, depending on what the source material is, you know, if it's uh, wheat, wheat grain, literally cheaper than dirt. Uh, and then you can, you can turn that into something that keeps people perpetually hungry. So they're going to buy more of it and it makes them more docile, more, more susceptible to marketing. You know, like I, I, I don't, I don't believe in a concerted effort to, you know, manipulate the population. And sometimes like, like you go on like the carnivore tribe and there's some people there that really are convinced that you know, like there's this big conspiracy to like just destroy uh, uh, sort of free will by uh, poisoning everybody with carbohydrates. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. That, that seems like a stretch. However, if people are more susceptible to suggestion, have poorer cognitive performance, uh, they they are a uh, better subject to market to, especially food products. Like, and and here's another thing about about vegetarianism and veganism. You can't really get to your basal metabolic rate plus activity, caloric needs by eating raw vegetables. So you're going to need to add in some processed vegetables, and. There's a processed vegetable I see people eating way more than vegetables, and that's candy bars. So, right. So, there, there are vegans and vegetarians who, because they're just, like, when they eat vegetables, they're so hungry. So, they can have pastries and candy bars, and they're like, yeah, but I'm still healthy because I'm vegan. And you're like, oh, no. Like, these are the drivers of type 2 diabetes. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, when I was a, when I was a teacher, I had a vegetarian bodybuilding, that book. And uh, I see the, girl, the guy's girlfriend now, and she looks like a, like a man. But anyway, <laughs> he, was, yeah. he was promoting Cliff Bars in that book. And I was like eating Cliff Bars. I'm like, man, I feel like crap eating these. You know, yeah. it's just like all these nut butters. And I've been studying the whole vegetable oil thing. And I think that's worse than sugar, like the unsaturated fats. Oh, you know, yeah. Oh, canola, yeah. Like safflower. These, these oils that, that just – well, when you have to denature something to an extreme degree – let's take wheat grain for, for an example – if you were to swallow a fistful of wheat grain, it would go right through you, like you swallowed a handful of gravel. Just go right through you. So to make it digestible, we have to grind it up and bleach it. So is that food? Like, <laughs> I say clearly no. Not, not for people. Now, a bird can swallow a seed and digest it just fine, but their biochemistry is totally different than ours. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's a big like gorilla or cow argument. It's like a cow is like it's a ruminant, it has four stomachs. We have one stomach, right? Right. So. Right. <laughs> All, also, like comparing something to us just in general, like look at the cognitive performance of a human. Look at the cognitive performance of a deer or a gorilla. Like, why are we having that conversation? Like, because we know our brains work better with a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, like, like what defines us from the animals that are, you know, getting eaten? Yeah, and you just, you just landed it's from our a plane, brain, right? It's our yeah. cognitive abilities, so we should really look at that. <laughs> and hey, what do you know? When you choose a nutrition program that is optimized for your cognitive performance, muscular performance improves too. Huh. <laughs> it's almost like we're meant for that. <laughs> how much meat do you eat, by the way? Because I'm up to like one pound and I'm trying to increase, but it's... Well, do you, it's all... how do you do it? Do you do one meal a day or do you do... I, I eat multiple times a day, but uh, I do mostly local grass-fed. I like ground beef. I don't know. It's just easy for me. I like how it's just easy to eat. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's affordable, great. you know? Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, so it, de it depends. Like I, I travel a lot for business. I'm on the road more than half the time. Uh, so like sometimes I got to look at like who I'm, if I have like a dinner meeting or something like that, who I'm having it with. And um, unless it's somebody I really want to discuss nutrition with, like if it's for the medical device side for osteostrong, I don't want to take somebody out to a restaurant and then order three pounds of steak because <laughs> I'll put down three pounds of steak. And, you know, because then the whole meal will be about like, 
You ordered what? <laughs> You're not really going to eat that, are you? Are you bringing some home? <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. just what I eat for dinner. And then, then, <laughs> then that like dominates the conversation. So I, what I'll do is like, okay, I'll, I'll go and I'll take care of, you know, maybe two thirds of my nutrition earlier in the day. So when I show up for dinner, I can just have a normal size entree and that doesn't become the subject of the meeting, especially when I meet with like, with like physicians who, cause I meet with physicians all the time who refer their patients to osteostrong locations for bone density. And then I, then I order three pounds of meat. Like I'll get the tomahawk for two and then a New York steak on top of that. <laughs> and I only, I only had to make that mistake like three or four times. And <laughs> they're like, well, okay. Osteostrong is great and all, but what are you doing? You're going to get a heart attack. Them and, you know, that, that just, it just becomes a total distraction. Yeah. What about your arteries? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. Um, and speaking of arteries, uh, just kind of circling back, uh, cardiovascular exercise. I love that shirt you have, like no weights, no cardio, just X3. I have a bike. I hike in the woods. Uh, it's my understanding that short bursts of like high intensity is health is better for longevity. Uh, yeah. and cardiovascular kind of shrinks the organs and glands, right? Or have you heard that? So steady state cardio will increase cortisol and decrease growth hormone. And you have to look at the central nervous system like it's an engineering team. It's constantly working to optimize your body. So you can't look in the mirror at yourself and say, hmm, I could lose 10 pounds and have your central nervous system say, oh, okay. We'll help with that. That's not how you communicate with your central nervous system. You need to give it a clear signal based on mechanisms of the human body. And this is like just what I said right there, like a lot of exercise completely ignores physiology, like just, just so much nonsense stuff out there. Uh, but when you want to be as lean as possible, which I think just about everybody wants to. You don't meet many people that, that say like, I really want to get fatter. Like I'm really looking to put on some, you know, fat rolls on my back. Like nobody says that. So since we all want to be leaner, um, you have to look at where the central nervous system is going to optimize for that. So when you do steady state cardio, your central nervous system says, oh, we need to move long distances and use less energy moving those distances. So we're gonna decrease growth hormone, which will dismantle muscle tissue. And we're gonna increase cortisol, which will force more storage of body fat. There's 40 years of research on this subject. So that's why that right there, that one thing stimulated me to start that YouTube show I have falsehoods of fitness. Now it doesn't come out on a regular basis. Sometimes I do two in a week and sometimes I wait two months to do one. But whenever somebody brings up something where I'm like, wow, people still think that unbelievable. So the cardio thing, like I meet so many people, especially women who think cardio is the answer to all their problems. And I'm like, no, you're making the problem worse. You're fighting with your endocrine system. Like that's one of the most powerful systems of the body. And you're doing the opposite. And then on, on top of that, then you get guys who strength train, who when they strength train, they're doing stabilization movements and they're upregulating growth hormone and downregulating cortisol. And then when they go and do cardio, they do the opposite. So what's going to happen to their physiology? Probably nothing. Yeah. yeah. Right, because <laughs> they're, they're giving themselves opposing stimuli. So... It's like one or the other. And also, there's a great article, you know, if you Google it, um, and it, it, it relies heavily on a, a meta-analysis, uh, but there's basically a, a, about 100 studies that are referenced in this article. The article is called, There's No Such Thing as Cardio. It's great because it, it shows you that strength training, not necessarily high intensity, high intensity interval, which has become kind of a buzzword and also misused. Uh, strength training will give you cardiovascular health, which is slightly different than cardiovascular performance. 
So like if, if you want to run a marathon, strength training is not your answer. You got to run, you got to run marathons. But I would argue that might not be the healthiest practice. What I would say is go for cardiac health via strength training. And the point of this article, there's no such thing as cardio, is that cardio is just a really lousy approach to strength training because you're contracting muscle, but you're using a load that's so light that it's really, it's not going to stimulate any growth. You're beating up on your joints, especially repetitive, like re repetitive uh, uh, the movements are very damaging to joints, especially over like hours, you know, hours per week. That, does, that doesn't make any sense. So, and then, and then that's all to affect the cardiovascular system. But then after a couple of years, you may lose some biomechanics because of the repetitive joint issues. And, you know, now you can't run at all. So, and then how about, how about cycling? lose bone density because there's no impact. Wow. Yeah. And every time, every time there's a muscular contraction, every time an axon and a dendrite communicate, you're losing calcium. Well, the body doesn't replace that because it actually, you're, you're showing the central nervous system that you should be lighter, right? So bone density is heavy. So why should you be carrying all that density around? You're not going through high impact. Wow. Of course, when you do go through high impact, you get a fracture. Now, if you look at the strength athlete, that engineering team slash central nervous system is like, okay, we're going to be a Formula One car. We're going to be, we're going to have a powerful engine, which is muscle. We're going to have a powerful chassis. You ever look at a chassis of a Formula One car? The whole car basically is a chassis. There's not much else. And, uh, and then you have a huge fuel tank in the Formula One car? No, you have just enough fuel to finish the race. That's it. So, and that's, in essence, body fat. Whereas like, you know, you're doing cardio, you're gonna be more like, you know, an economy car. Little that tires, sense. lightweight frame, uh, big gas tank, so you're storing a lot of body fat. So I see these, these guys who are really, really excited about cardio, it's like they're skinny fat. You know, they have very little musculature, and yeah, they may be thin, they may weigh less than I do, but they're weak. That makes total yeah. sense. So yeah. bike riders need to go to osteo strong facilities and balance sure. it out. <laughs> oh, every cyclist should absolutely go to osteo strong. And I understand yeah. enjoying riding a bicycle. Bicycle is probably the most efficient machine that's ever been created. Like if you look at how much work can be done, you can take a 150, 200 pound person and move them a hundred miles with significant effort. But you can go a hundred miles on that machine. And all you need is your body weight and the energy to push those pedals. That's amazing. Awesome. Love the bicycle. Very efficient. Not from an exercise perspective, but from a practicality perspective, it's awesome. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say, like, if you're a cyclist, you got to do other stuff. you got to strength train. You got to do something for your bone density. And I would definitely tell them to go to osteostrom because they have, cyclists have lower bone mass than runners do for that, for that reason. Wow. I've also heard the seat can give prostate problems because it's rubbing on that area. Yeah. Uh, you're basically just sitting on your prostate. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, it's a funny thing because there's been so much effort to try and make the seat lighter weight. So you end up just sitting on this like, kind of pipe that gets wide at one end and it's just pushing on your prostate gland and uh yeah like it's sort of like if you, if you ever know somebody who's like a hypochondriac and they keep poking at one of their lymph nodes and then like i think my lymph node is swollen i think i have you know like like lymphedema or something like that and i'm like yeah you keep poking at it that's probably why it's inflamed stop doing that like seriously this is like a problem with people who think they have diseases it sometimes it's they they look for a symptom and then they do something to trigger that symptom and they go see i'm dying i'm so glad you said that i get messages on instagram all the time i'm like you know all these complicated heady questions i'm like you're overthinking it just lower your stress you know it'll take time right. <laughs> you know, just like calm down right. <laughs> yep. um so what would you say for someone to lose weight because i have friends that i see them you know 
snapping videos of them, you know, running first thing in the morning and they're, you know, weight loss and they're sweating. And you just explain the whole process of decreasing growth hormone and increasing cortisol, which stores fat. So if someone doesn't have the X3 bar yet, like what's just some quick advice you would give someone to like start to lose weight? Like, I, I would just cut carbohydrates out of your life. Interesting. You asked that question because I used to think carnivore nutrition was extreme and sort of the, the general ketogenic nutrition was the more the mainstream way to go and should be the recommendation. I now feel the opposite because when you still standard ketogenic nutrition, you still have a lot of vegetables in your diet. Uh, Like you read the Bulletproof diet and it's 200 pages about how great meat is. And then in like the last 10 pages, it's like you still should be getting seven or eight servings of vegetables a day. And you're like, wait a minute, not enough room in the intestines for all that. And I asked Dave that question. Dave's a friend of mine. I was my first podcast was Dave's podcast. Um, so you know his his attitude is well. I I didn't want to argue with all the great research for some of the vegetable nutrition, but when it, I, I accepted that answer, and I think it was a good one at the time. But since then, I've been trafficking in in grabbing a hold of a lot of research about vitamin like how what what vitamins do we actually need i want you to answer a question for me how many of you just to eat whole foods so just meats fruits vegetables stuff you can pick off trees no supplements no powders no processed foods how many calories on average would you need to get to the recommended daily intakes ascribed by the American Medical Association. Take a guess. Uh, 5,000. 27,000 per day. Wow. Right. So that kind of tells you, like, these recommendations of what vitamins you need are just kind of nonsense. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've kind of taken a different – I kind of do carnivore plus raw goat milk and honey. That's kind of how I do it. And I do a lot of bone broth. And I just study, like, the glycogen in the liver and how that – 90% 90% of T4 to T3 conversion happens there to, to fuel every cell in the body. And there's kind of an argument over, you know, thyroid health and thyroid hormone. And sure. um, I'm just trying to look at it holistically. And I, I feel better when I include honey and milk. And so okay. I'm how many, how many, what, how many grams of carbohydrate? Cause both honey and milk have pretty Quite high levels. How many grams a day do you think? Probably hundred, 150 at least. Oh, wow. uh, but, uh, but yeah, I've been gaining size on it and I couldn't before. It might be X3, I don't know, but that's great. <laughs> of course it's X3. <laughs> yeah. Superior training. Yeah. I, I, I constantly get in this place, especially talking to people online, where they're asking, well, like, like you don't lift. No, I don't. I'm a very muscular person, very lean person. And so they say, so like, is weightlifting stupid? And like, I don't really want to answer that question because there's a lot of people who really like weightlifting. And uh, I, I, the way I answer it is I will never lift a weight again because it is not a good use of my time. Uh, and the risk to reward ratio is not worth it now that I know what I can achieve with X3. Uh, and it's not just because I invented it. Like it, it really is a massive driver of being lean and being muscular and being as strong as possible. But I don't, I often don't know how far to go when I say that just because I don't want someone to just think like, that's just crazy, but I can demonstrate it. Like those seven studies. Oh, here's another one. Uh, well, this may work for beginners, but it certainly wouldn't work for advanced people. Why? Because an advanced athlete has a different type of muscle than a beginner? Like, there's never been research that showed that, ever. So, uh, you know, like, and never mind the fact that two of the studies of the seven, uh, three of the studies of the seven were done with uh, Division One collegiate athletes who are highly trained. So, like, and like I said earlier, like if you have weights and then weights plus variants, 
What's the important factor? Variance. So uh, the, the only other thing that I think I'd add, like what your listeners might be interested in is the amount of variance was a big question, I think, to everyone. So, you know, somebody was holding X amount of weight at the bottom of a chest press and 1.2X at the top, that's variance. And they were getting better results out of that. Well, what I did with my bone density research is I showed that when you have X at the bottom, you actually can hold 7X at the top. Yeah. So, okay. Now I know what the difference in variance is. And all I had to do at that point was study force curves. And so I, I used some of the equipment that I had, the testing equipment I have, and I developed a force curve for different movements and looked at the force curves and said, okay, the force curve is like an S curve in every movement except for the bent row, which is more like a sine wave. So like a bell, as opposed to uh, an S moving up and then, and then coming down uh, at the end. By the way, all muscles turn off at the end of the movement, which is why we keep constant tension, right? Because if you, if you had muscular power in your fully contracted position, you could break your own joints. So they shut off for a reason. So when, when looking at the bone density research I did on top of the existing body of literature on variable resistance, I just put those two things together and looked at the force curves and said, okay, so we don't need 7x at the top because otherwise we would get stuck somewhere in the middle because the, the variable resistance nature of latex is not linear. It's an S-curve, just like our muscle, but it's not the same S-curve. So you got to get that S-curve beneath what the capacity, the human capacity S-curve is. And so that's why I designed the movements the way they are. Like it's doubled over in the chest press, singled in the overhead press. You go for a lighter band in the overhead press. So there was a couple of different ratios I had to like get just right before launching X3. But that, that ultimately ended up, it, it, the, the, the eureka moment was when I was looking at that data from deconditioned elderly females out of at the University of East London and, uh, and where when they were doing this study, and I'm looking at the data, and I compared it to what the American College of Sports Medicine keeps for average load, loading data of gym goers. It was a seven-fold difference, because my device was using the impact ready range, and they're using full range, slash weak range. Because if you're doing full, you've got the weak in there, and that's the limiting factor. So when I look at the differences between those two things, like, wow, we are leaving so much muscular tissue not stimulated when we lift weights. So there is a better way. And also, the, the, probably the best part about X3, besides the time, you know, only 10 minutes a day, it's so simple and elegant. When you're done with it, you can drop it in a drawer. Like, like people, I know people who have whole rooms of their house just filled with weights and all kinds of different machines. And it's like, oh, I need all this to stay in shape. And, you know, I think, I think about these guys who, even some of the people on the forum, uh, Maykel and, and Brandon, have, they had weight rooms that they just got rid of because they have an X3 now. And it's awesome. they're getting better results than they had versus a room full of weights. I have friends and I see their Instagram stories, you know, trainers and working with trainers in a gym. And yeah. I'm sure you've studied artificial light and indoors under artificial light. And it's just, mm. I, a lot of your videos are outside. I'd say most of them. And that I'll was do just that for a, big, a reason because I yeah. want people to say, God, I'd love to lift outside. That looks <laughs> right. great. It, it is great. I do it every day. I never do it inside. <laughs> I love it. And uh, kind of ju jumping uh you have the GH accelerator and I, I heard about uh, whole body vibration through Dave Asprey and I bought his like plate. Sure. And, uh, can you use the X3 on that? Cause I think that's like 30, uh, 30 cycles per second or something. 30 vibrations. 30 is the optimal. Yeah. Don't, don't get one that doesn't do 30 Hertz. Don't need yeah. to necessarily get mine, but don't get one that doesn't do 30 hertz. It's like cheap ones with the handlebar right on Amazon. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You get what you pay for uh, um, with the whole body vibration. So, vibration. So, I did a meta analysis uh, 
which is for, I already mentioned meta-analysis earlier, but that, that's when you take all the research in one subject and kind of condense it all with statistics to get to a more definitive answer. So for, for the listeners that don't know what that is. So there's meta-analysis. Um, took all that, that, that data, I found 23 different data sets that showed that stabilization firing especially in rapid succession, was associated with the upregulation of growth hormone. And the only variable beyond that that, uh, that changed the level of growth hormone triggered in, in its pulses, we talked about pulses of this, was load. Meaning if you're holding a larger load and you have stabilization firing, that engages the body in more stabilization firing, right? Like I can stand on one leg and there's a little bit of tonic contraction that I go through. But if I, you know, pick up my girlfriend and I stand on one leg, well, there's a whole lot more stabilization firing that has to go on to keep me upright and to keep me from dropping her, which she always appreciates. <laughs> uh, so you have to, when you, when you look at the, the, the research, I knew that we have stabilization firing with X3 on its own because you're holding a load higher than you could normally ever hold, but only in that stronger range of motion, which makes it safe to use. You're not gonna, the chances of an injury are very low. And, and because of that extra stabilization firing, you're gonna have a greater growth hormone event. Now, if we could use the X3 on a slightly unstable surface like a vibration platform, then we can get an even better effective growth hormone. Wow. That's, that's, awesome. that's where the GH accelerator uh, came in. And would I just put like a, like a blanket over? Because I can imagine putting that plate on there, probably slide off and break my Well, neck so the something. GH accelerator is pressure triggered. You step on it and it turns on. You step okay. off it, it turns off. That's cool. Yeah. I have the patent on that. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have uh, over 300 patents. Uh, wow. Yeah, different... Yeah. So the um, is that thirty cycles yours the GH or no no you wouldn't be able to patent a frequency mm. people have tried to do that but the patent office is like that's not an invention <laughs> the number thirty is not an invention <laughs> uh, so but the pressure switch is and so so that way the the basically the ground plate drops right into the accelerator. Cool. And then when you step on it, then it then it switches on. You step off it, it switches off. So you don't have to worry about turning your vibration platform around the, uh, on, and then it wanders around the room. You can grab a hold of it and put your X3 on top and then quickly jump before the ground plate vibrates off it, which is, you know, what's happening with yours. That's cool. Uh, wow. And how much would you say that increases the efficiency of the X3? Like 30%? Right. Uh, it'd be hard to say. Uh, I do know that, okay, uh, I, I can sort of answer that question based on what we've seen in research. So the, one of the re references I had in that, in that meta-analysis was comparing leg presses to squats. So you use more weight in the leg press, uh, but they compared the growth hormone upregulation from one versus the other. And what they saw was that uh, regular free weight squatting, even though you use half the weight that you would use in a leg press, it increased growth hormone by 600%. Whereas the leg press increased it by 0%. Didn't do anything. Uh, which make, This is like the trying to get a tan with candles. I say that all the time. Because I just want to point out that there are certain stimuli that are communicating with the central nervous system. There are other stimuli that are not. And uh, the things that are not, we shouldn't do them. So now when I look at what happened with the greatest loading in vibration cohort that was analyzed in this, in this study, we saw that those individuals could increase growth hormone by 2,600%. So I would, so regular X3 is going to give you more than just a regular free weight squat because you're holding more in the stronger range. So your guess is as good as mine, you know, whether it's 800 or 1,000 or 1,500%. But then, you know, with the GH accelerator, it's going to be closer to that 2,600%.
That's incredible. So that's yeah. super cool. Yeah, uh, that's great. I wanted to talk about stress relief because uh, I think for me, I recommend if someone you know just got in a car accident or you know broke up or lost their job, something just to take a little bit off, take some time off, maybe go on light walks and stuff. Because um, as we talked about, I think like heavy exercise can increase cortisol. But sure, um, using X three, I've noticed like a noticeable difference in my mood and uh, and, and lower stress because um, you're affecting your neurochemistry right on a pretty profound level. Um, when you're, when you're doing these loads, right? <laughs> I don't know if you've looked at that, like dopamine increase or different things. So, <laughs> so there's a researcher that I've worked with in the past, who's a clinical psychologist. And he was actually the principal investigator on that, uh, university of London, uh, university of East London study. And he took a lot of the psychological measures. It was funny because he was, his name is Basil Hunt, brilliant guy. Uh, and, and so he's all interested in the psychological measures, w well-being measures. And, of course, I was completely thinking physiology. And so and he says this to me, and I'm thinking, like, who cares? Like, well-being. Like, would anyone want to know that? I guess. Now, of course, it turns out, like, that was, like, almost more exciting than, than some of the other things because we're showing people they can control their health. Both my inventions, Calcium Strong, X3, people can clearly see they're in control. They can actually affect something. Whereas there's the regular person goes to the gym month after month, year after year, they see nothing. And it's very disheartening. That's why they quit. So uh, from that perspective, yes. And from an Oscar Strong perspective, uh, especially the type 2 diabetes study, the metabolic disease study that was done, uh, there's a lot of depression that's associated with metabolic dysfunction because uh, they feel like their health is just out of control. So every time they go to the doctor, they're worse. And they may be trying, they're probably carbohydrate addicted, and they're just constantly eating things that are telling them to constantly eat. Grains. <laughs> or say it again? Grains, right? Wheat. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Grains or, or sugars or fruit or whatever. But like I said, it's it's great to be in the carbohydrate business because your customer's always hungry. And uh, I, I also like to say, like, people don't get fat because they eat too much. They get fat because they're hungry all the time. And that's like the ketogenic is sort of sold as, it, as it's a miracle at times. It's just because you're not hungry all the time. Like the reason people get fat isn't because their hand just accidentally keeps putting food in their mouth. It's because they're hungry. Like yeah. <laughs> address that. I think it's and a lot that of that research is just totally clear. It's a lot of chemical addiction too, probably right. I mean, I go to cost, well, Costco yeah, here like, and there. like a like a Twinkie is certainly more <laughs> addictive than an apple. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because the glycemic index is different, and it's meant to hit the bloodstream faster, and then you're hungrier. Faster. Yeah. Well, I go to Costco, put, single... How about if you look in the 1960s and 70s, how much MSG they used to put in the food? <laughs> yeah, crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, do you do any bone broth ever? You drink that? Or? I have uh, experimented with it. I didn't feel that I needed it. Uh, also, like looking at like what fast it is. I'm, I'm, I'm less enchanted with the term fasted. I prefer to call it insulin restricted. You probably heard me say that in a couple other videos, yeah. Uh, because fasted means nothing. It means you eat nothing, you drink nothing other than water. So somebody will say, oh, you drank coffee, you ruined your fast. Well, okay, like let's not get wrapped up in definitions here. Most people's objective is keeping an insulin event from happening so that you're burning your own body fat. Uh, also, autophagy, which I think is actually undersold. I hear a lot of people in the fitness industry like rolling their eyes at that term, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who cares? Like, that's stupid. Nobody cares about cellular regeneration. Well, yes, except it is a huge marker for health. Now, I don't think it's studied enough. Like, we don't have enough evidence. Uh, you know who Sim Land is, right? 
haven't heard of him. No. Oh, yeah, great. I was on his uh, podcast uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Simland, a uh, German guy, and uh, I believe he lives in Austria. And he's um, really rounded up all the relevant research on cellular regeneration. And um, basically, your old cells turn into fuel for growth of new cells. And uh, I'm actually running a small autophagy experiment on myself, and I'm tracking markers. Uh, so it's, it's going to be very interesting when I, when I come out with that. Uh, you'll know about it. Everybody will know about it. Uh, very cool. But, but so, the, you know, those, those are the objectives. And so whether it's fasted with no, no, no calories or, you know, somebody had some bone broth, which might be, 20 calories, but we know to create an insulin event, you have to have like 50. Like, don't get wrapped up in the definition. So I'm, I was in favor of bone broth. Uh, I just, you know, I didn't see a particular need for it. Yeah. There's a pretty cool, like, glycine helps with glyphosate because glyphosate, that herbicide, is a yeah, yeah, yeah. glycine analog. Right so it's yeah. kind of a nice... Yeah, and I guess glyphosate's in the rain. It's in all the spring water. And so it's kind of crazy <laughs> situation. Wow. Um, but yeah, uh, the Elite Bar, I just wanted to talk about that for a second. I just ordered it. So that's your like strongest. And just, just to tell people, there's four bands that come with it, a ground plate and a bar. And then this Elite this elite band is your strongest band, right? And that's like, takes yeah, a while to get, so get up the, to that. The four, the, four, the four latex bands that it comes with, uh, most people will be able to leverage those uh, and get great use out of them and, Grow muscular tissue, be leaner. Uh, of course, only 10 minutes a day. And like I said, you throw this thing in a drawer when you're done with it so it doesn't take up a room in your house like a lot of strength training equipment that you have around. Or you can just take it outside and do it. Um, but for the, let's call it top 5% strength type people, there is the elite band. And that one, like for me, it's, I think it's a, like 620 pounds in a, in a deadlift. And it's a 540 in a chest press. So those are the two moves. Oh, I use it for squats too. I use it for single leg squats. Uh, so that's, I think, 263 pounds, if I remember correctly. I had to eat your meal before I try that. <laughs> your three <laughs> steaks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good well, I don't work out on a full stomach. Yeah. I work faster, <laughs> nice. To be clear. But yeah, yeah. Like that, that is for the people who really develop a considerable amount of strength. Also, uh, people who, who might need that one are maybe a little shorter. And because the stretch of the band is a key determinant of how much force is there. So somebody who's uh, with shorter legs and shorter arms is going to use a heavier band. Then, okay. or, or conversely, like when I, uh, like the Miami Heat uses X3 and, uh, they, it's a, their, their strength program really relates to, uh, it's a, a kind of all built around, uh, around X3. That's cool. And uh, yeah, yeah. I got to go and train with them and talk to the strength coaches. Uh, awesome, awesome guys. And, um, what I noticed is those guys hardly touched the black band and they definitely did not need the elite because they're so tall. Right. So they're getting a greater amount of force based on the stretch of the band. So they use the lighter bands, but it's still very heavy for them just because of their height. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Also like it, it, that's a great example of why not to get too wrapped up in like, like compare yourself to yourself. Don't compare yourself to someone else. I see some of these guys on, on the discussion groups like, oh, I can do the black band 40 repetitions for whatever. And, and I really want to say, yeah, but you're 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> so stop trying to make other people jealous. <laughs> like that, <laughs> That's why you can do that. But that's not even like the point. It's like just yeah. compare yourself to yourself. It's not a contest yeah. with you and someone else. Is the objective of the product is to make you as strong and as lean as possible. Yeah, I like it. And and in your your twelve week, you get you have a little awesome YouTube series. 
um, and you can get progressively stronger bands that you use. Um, I'm at the point where sometimes I just do like five to 10 reps. Do you think uh, I'm using too heavy of a band or how do you, is there a way to kind of gauge or? Yeah, you really want 15 reps to be the minimum. You want to okay. go 15 or over. Okay. Uh, and like, like for me, for like calf raises, I'm up to 60 repetitions of the black band. <laughs> like it's much better to go higher rep because you don't want to compare it to regular weightlifting type repetitions. Like you'd never go 60 repetitions with, with a weight, Be, but with variable resistance, you're delivering a huge load in that stronger range of motion. So that, that's really where you, you, you don't want to go beneath. And if you are beneath 15 repetitions, you want to make sure that the second time you do that same exercise, so two days later, 48 hours later, that you're increasing your performance and you will get over that 15. Because otherwise, you're kind of stuck behind that strength curve. Right. You know, your, your, the band S curve is not underneath your capacity S curve. It's in front of, and that becomes a problem. You're not truly taking the stronger range of motion and fatigue. Okay, perfect. And then to start, you have three rest days and then you move to one rest day. Is one like the minimum rest day you would recommend? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, cool. you still need a, you need a day off. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, cool. And then I had a friend ask, what is the most beneficial exercise that should be done with it? It's not really a, they're, they're all good, right? <laughs> well, I different parts of the body, but probably the deadlift, uh, the X3 deadlift, like, like that, that changes your posture. Uh, for women, it changes the way the back of their legs look. So like a lot of women, are, they don't like the way the back of their legs look, even though they might not be overweight. They just don't have even skin. But as soon as you grow that muscle there, as soon as you grow the hamstring, that skin flattens right out. So m most of those women who complain or not overweight and don't like the way the back of their legs look, it's got nothing to do with their body fat, it's they, they just gotta grow the hamstring a little bit. And the only way previously to do that was deadlifts, which are dangerous on the back and on the neck. But X3 deadlifts offload the places where people get injured. So you can actually get use a higher weight with more repetitions, with far less injury risk, and you can really fix the body by doing that. So the, if there were a one movement, it would be the deadlift. Awesome. Yeah. Uh well, cool, John. Anything that we missed that you wanted to, to mention before we wrap up? or uh, Maybe the website, x3bar.com. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll put all the links below. And, sure. Uh, uh, also, if you want to find me, uh, it's at D-R-J-A-Q-U-I-S-H on Instagram or Dr. John Jakewish on Facebook. Awesome. Yeah, now I know how to pronounce your last names. <laughs> there you go. Why? Well, so many people read it. Like, they, you, know, they don't, you don't hear somebody say it all the time. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, uh, stick around and I'm going to close out the show. Thanks for coming on. Awesome. Well, that wraps up today's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I definitely recommend going to his YouTube channel. If you're interested in learning more, I'll put the links below. He has a lot of really great videos and his 12 week program, although it might sound corny, is amazing. I remember growing up and seeing my mom watch the Gilad tapes, which you know, you work out to what's on the screen. And, and what's cool is after the 12 weeks, you're not on your own. They have a Facebook group. There's a great community of people to help and you could always improve even if it's just the breathing. They talk about different breathing techniques you can do. And there's a huge nutrition part to this. If you're not getting enough protein and calories, it's impossible to gain. And I'm personally a hard gainer. I can eat and eat and eat. And it's very difficult for me to gain weight, but gaining muscle with X3 has been working out for me and people are noticing. So it's pretty cool. And you might be wondering my favorite protein sources. It's red meat, grass-fed beef. I get it locally. I also like elk, venison, and bison. Probably my favorite type of meat. And lately I've just been eating a lot of ground meat. It's very affordable and I buy it in bulk. And if you're interested in 
upgrading your protein source, I recommend getting a chest freezer and so that you could store many, many pounds of meat. And it's also food security. It's really nice to have that much food stored up and it lasts forever in the freezer. And you just thaw it out. And I aim to eat one pound of meat a day and I'm even working up for that. And it's working out great. I feel the mental benefits, the mood benefits. I'm seeing myself finally putting on size. And there's so many nutrients in red meat that are just incredible. And especially when you balance it out with bone broth, because bone broth contains the complementary amino acids, glycine, proline, that actually make eating meat a neutral process where normally it's slightly inflammatory to the body. So that's pretty cool. And I also include quite a bit of carbohydrates. I do a lot of raw goat's milk. That's another excellent protein source. I do royal jelly. That's another excellent protein source. I blend in bee pollen in my shake with those two things. And that's an awesome protein shake. So there are a lot better options than whey that I used to do. And I think people should just get back to milk. Find a local farmer. And if it works for you, try some raw goat's milk and see how you feel on that. I'll put a link below to purchase the X3 bar. It helps me out and you also save a little bit on the purchase and it pretty much lasts forever. It's a really, really incredible invention. I'm obsessed with it. I don't miss a day. I use it six days a week, 10 minutes or less. And as always, if you want to support my work, you can go to matt-blackburn.com and find all of my recommended products there, which I constantly update. And also my personal brand, which is mitolife.co. And I have my enzyme products. I'm about to come out with another one. And then I'm actually formulating another product. That's really exciting to me because I love creating and I love sharing and helping you guys out. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, share it on social media, subscribe, and leave a nice review. That really helps me out. Today's quote is by Dr. Ray Peet. Exercise like aging, obesity, and diabetes increases the levels of circulating free fatty acids and lactate, but ordinary activity of an integral sort activates the systems in an organized way, increasing carbon dioxide in circulation and efficiency. Different types of exercise have been identified as destructive or reparative to the mitochondria. Concentric muscular work is said to be restorative to the mitochondria. As I understand it, this means contraction with the load and relaxation without a load. The heart's contraction follows this principle, and this could explain the observation that heart mitochondria don't change in the course of ordinary aging. <laughs>